Hi, welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. A Shirt and Tender is what the New York Times called Emily Layden's debut novel, All Girls, which town and country complemented as sharp and engrossing, and predicted was sure to become a touchstone among the beloved niche of boarding school novels, earning an instant fan in Taylor Jenkins Reid, who raved about this exciting, innovative debut from a fresh and assured new voice, telling a sincere, poignant, and moving story. While Kirkus Reviews has crowned her inventive follow-up once more from the top as a juicy mystery filled with gossip and music you can almost hear. And she's here today to talk about it all. Emily, welcome to the show. Growing up in a family of writers, please talk a bit about the storytelling world you were surrounded by as a child and how young you began partaking yourself creatively. Yeah, for sure. So as I mentioned, my dad is a writer. His brother, my uncle, is a longtime journalist at Sports Illustrated. My cousin, who's just a year older than me, is now a television writer. Um, we, we are a family of storytellers. Um, and from truly like a very young age, and I don't, I don't know if this is like twee or obnoxious to share, <laughs> um, but you know, we, Kristen and I would, would write you know, little plays and demand that the whole family watch them in our living room. Um, and that sort of, it was always, it was always encouraged or at least humored. Um, and I think that that is, I think that my creativity was always, um, yeah, was always encouraged by my family. And, but critically, I saw every day in my dad what it was to be a working writer. And you do, I think you do have to sort of see it to believe it. And I, it, being a writer was therefore more of a real possibility to me than I think most kids might imagine. My first computer game was, um, <laughs> the an american girl doll computer game i don't I, <laughs> and that game game was actually like you wrote a, a a script and then the dolls acted out your script on screen um and it was really like a screenwriting game but they pitched it as like you know you got to tell stories with your dolls um and so i do think maybe there were that the memory of that game is very strong for me and playing it in my on my basement computer you know when i was nine or whatever um and i think maybe um the there were just sort of maybe some more protected spaces to to try out your writing than just like a diary. Alongside your family, who else do you count before or once you arrived at Stanford University as important influences in your writing development? Definitely my dad is was a huge influence on me as a kid, um, both as a working writer and as a storyteller. I mean, like my dad told me original bedtime stories when I was growing up um, that he just like made up on the spot every night. Um, but I had, I, I did have some excellent teachers. Um, my freshman and sophomore years of high school, my teacher, Mrs. Koff, was fantastic and um, really made me feel, It's I think it's all about like legit, like wanting to feel validated and legitimized. And um, Mrs. Koff and teachers and professors I had at Stanford were really, critical and just making me feel like the way I thought and the way I expressed myself was, was valid and promising. I didn't know what I wanted to study when I went to Stanford. Um, I really, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I, again, always loved writing, wanted to be a writer in my heart, in my heart of hearts, but like knew that very few people make a living as a writer at 23 when they graduate school, right? So needed some sort of something that I was gonna do also just in case the whole writing thing doesn't work out. I thought I'd be a lawyer, like, you know, most most writers, I think at some point think they might go to law school. Um, and I sort of cast about for a couple of years before I, I think I took my first creative writing class my, in the winter of my sophomore year. And um, it was, 
it was a life raft. Um, I wasn't always sure I fit in at Stanford. It wasn't, it wasn't easy for me, um, like in, culturally. And, and um, I was very far from home and uh, it was a, it, it, that class was like a homecoming. And now here we are in college. You, you get, a, you, you're assigned short stories, right? That's, that's the workshop task. Um, I did, write a draft of a novel for my honors thesis at Stanford. Um, and that was um, based on the life of a um, 19th century abortion provider in New York who had like a very, she made millions as an abortionist and had a very sort of dramatic and lavish life. Um, and until she died by suicide when the, when the cops were, imminently closing in on her finally because of course abortion was illegal at the time um and uh so i wrote a i wrote a novel about her um in college uh but that was an academic exercise <laughs> people magazine would hail your debut that followed with all girls as an insightful prep school drama where the New York Times, like many, discovered you explore the complex bonds between students and the slow-turning gears of a revered but old-fashioned institution. Where even still, the pages turn fast and the girls are complex, compelling, and written with incredible tenderness. What first inspired you to set this story over a year at Atwater Boarding School in Connecticut? And had you attended or taught at one of these yourself as source material? I spent most of my 20s teaching at boarding schools. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a public school kid. I went to public school. Boarding school is a very strange concept, strange, but fascinating concept to me, you know, as someone who read prep, Curtis and Feld's prep was like a foundational text for me. Um, certainly was really intrigued and curious about what it would be like to go to boarding school, but I did not go to one. And then I taught at them, um, and I, it's a, it is, it's just an endlessly rich culture, um, for mining for story. Um, and I think that any place that is, um, any place that is so insular, um, that has a feeling of claustrophobia, right, is really rich for storytelling and boarding schools have that among many other juicy elements uh in in tropes i always saw all girls as really like a collection of linked stories um or a novel in stories right and so that um that was that was always the i never saw it any other way i never like wrote this book with one narrator and then changed course um i began with a character map um and so and I think that probably one of my strengths as a writer or as a creator is world building. Um, and so that is that is where I feel I feel safest. How then through your own teaching experiences did you weave in the constant competition teachers face from students' smartphones, iPads, and laptops being used during class to cruise social media on the slide versus paying attention to what's on the board, so to speak? It's a total nightmare. It's a nightmare as a teacher, it's a nightmare as a storyteller, right? Like like Tech ruins everything. Um, you know, I, I also am a screenwriter and we're constantly looking for ways to like not have something, believable ways to not have something happen on a screen that you know damn well in real life would happen on a screen. Um, it just is a challenge. And I think um, I tried to do it with as light, a, to keep it light but believable. Um, you get away with it a little bit again by the insularity of the world. The girls are together all the time, like literally, right? Like sleeping together. And that just, um, that does, I think that helped my case. The idea that they're, they are just the dorm room over is, is useful. Parade celebrated the authenticity you created within this first work of what it's like to attend a promising prestigious New England prep school, even as it's engulfed in a scandal at once silenced. Adding that in all girls, a diverse cast and nine young women offer shifting perspectives, discover their voices, and navigate friendships and fears in the middle of crisis. 
Did it make sense from the start to write each chapter from the perspective of a different character? And who along the way became any of your favorite voices to tell the story through? Macy, who uh, begins our novel, the freshman, she's not, um, she's not the very first, her Lauren is the very first, but Macy is a freshman runner. She struggles with, um, it's not named this in the, in the text, but in my head, she struggles with ARFID, which is a type of eating disorder, um, called avoid and restricted avoidant restricted food intake disorder um and uh I really loved I really loved writing Macy um I thought that readers would find her too weird and too young um to really relate to her and actually I found you know through through the all girls process that people loved Macy um and that was really um, meaningful to me as a writer. For example, in the movie Promising Young Woman, with, you know, with Carrie Mulligan written by Emerald Fen Fennell, it's a, a feminist revenge fantasy. It is, it is a movie about rape. And the word rape is, is literally never said. It does not appear in the script. And that is like, it's, it's like the, the specter of something is, is sometimes more powerful than the presence of something, right? It's all, that's also like a very classic horror movie move, right? Like don't hold back on the monster as long as you can. The anticipation of the monster is more powerful than actually when the monster jumps out. Um, and not that boys are <laughs> the monsters in the movie, um, but uh, I do think there was the opportunity in all girls, especially in, in a story that is a, the inciting incident is a, is a sexual assault um, to show how something that is not present can still be incredibly, nonetheless, psychologically present. It's not satire. The book is not satire. And, you know, the various sort of communique that you see from the administration in the novel uh, um, is not... Uh, is not satire, but there was an element of um, mimicking the way, you know, it, administration has a way of speaking, a sort of corporate ease, right? That is, that is eminently, um, if not right for mocking, at least like sort of, <laughs> it's really rich for, um for for mimicking and that was fun to be like sort of what how what is the sort of mealy mouthed stuff they're going to put forward here um and i say that not without sympathy for the challenge of being a person who is tasked with um stewarding a sometimes right um a school that some of these schools have endowments in the in the many hundreds of millions of dollars. They answer to boards that are comprised of some of the most powerful people in our country or the world. Um, that is an incredible challenge. Um, and everybody's got to eat. Everybody's got to have a job, right? And at the end of the day, you know, many of these administrators are just like, trying to do their job and they have a lot of people that they're answering to and trying to do that. Did you find you had a pretty clear vision while you were writing of how you wanted the story to resolve? I did. I think that when I set out to write All Girls, I always wanted to write something that was a portrait of a community as much as um, any one person. And so I was very much kind of seeing myself working in the tradition of like an Elizabeth Strout or a Jennifer Egan, right? Like novels like A Visit from the Goon Squad or All of Kitteridge that are these sort of polyphonic stories. Um, and so I always had this choral effect in mind and that's thus all girls, this is not a plot spoiler, like ends with a chorus of voices. Um, and that was really sort of symbolically or metaphorically important to me. 
So what was the experience like for you with seeing the first book published, having it optioned by HBO so fast the whole world went? It's funny how quickly the goalposts shift, right? It just like immediately, you know, you sort of are worried about or thinking about the next thing that you want to do or the next thing that you want to achieve or I got through the door, how long are they going to let me stay? And um, that it's not that I, I was not thrilled or that the day we, you know, we sold girls literally overnight. Um, that, that day, that 24 hours did change my life. Um, but I, and I am so grateful to my agent and to my editor and, and yet I, you know, I was on the phone with television producers a week later, right? It was immediately, literally immediately. Um, I want, I want to, I want to develop this. Okay. I got to develop, I got to, you know, we got the deal at HBO. Then, then I want to make the show. The show didn't go. Okay, fine. I, what's my next one, right? What, um, I'm working on, you know, let's get the next book sold, right? Sold the next book. Okay. I want to develop that one. You're just sort of always, um, always just trying to keep it going. Um, and that is, uh, <laughs> um, this is the business we signed up for. Publishers Weekly would root on the powerhouse sophomore effort that you delivered for fans with once more from the top. Introducing readers in their glowing review to Dylan Reed, a chart-topping Grammy-winning singer-songwriter famous for her diaristic lyrics. The only major life event she hasn't written about is the disappearance of her friend Kelsey Kopastenki, who taught Dylan songwriting and seemed destined for greatness. Adding that once Kelsey's body years later is found in a lake, Layden skillfully intercuts Dylan's search for answers with sections chronicling her friendship with Kelsey and the evolution of her career. Authentic characters and Dylan's lyrical first-person narration bestow the proceedings with dimension, drama, and drive. When did you first get the idea to tell this story through each of our albums? And how entertaining was it for you? The idea of setting a murder mystery against the backdrop of the music business. I, I love music, <laughs> but like a lot of people love music. Um, I knew I wanted to write about fame um, and I wanted to write particularly about contemporary fame, particularly about the experiences of famous women and the, the sort of way fame I think has shifted for if you think about the way we thought about celebrities and like you know not just the mid-century but like even the 80s and 90s is kind of like these untouchable glamorous really aspirational things and now today celebrities are expected to be um especially women sure aspirational but also accessible and that is a really interesting tension to me and so I knew I wanted to write about that and so then it was a matter of okay in what sphere of, of fame do I want to put this story? And I wanted to write about an artist. Um, I didn't want to write about a writer, um, but I wanted to write about something I felt close to and songwriting. You know, I under, I'm a novelist. I understand writing poetry. I can teach myself to understand songwriting. Um, and so that's that's where we ended up. Everyone in the world knows Dylan Reed. Um, for 15 years, she has been a fixture on country and pop radio and in the celebrity discourse. Um, she is defined by both her confessional lyricism and a kind of like best friend image. And it's this combination that has kept her fans super close, the label happy and the media fed. But what no one knows as you mentioned, is that she has the secret, one thing she's never written about before, that her childhood best friend Kelsey disappeared uh, shortly before Dylan became famous. Um, and that loss and the circumstances surrounding that loss and the nature of their friendship and Kelsey's influence on Dylan's music um, are, are things that she has always, always struggled with and now the discovery of Kelsey's body at the start of the novel is going to force her to reckon with things that she's buried and hidden. The book is kind of structured it's um it's really is three timelines right it's it's the the present the arc of Dylan's career which takes us from when she becomes famous at 17 all the way to the present day and then 
the distant past, which is her friendship with Kelsey in high school. Um, and I knew that I wanted to tell this book in albums, um, right? I knew that I wanted to structure the novel in, in, in the arc of Dylan's career. And so that was always there. And then the goal of the book is to, in part, show how do I demonstrate in a way that will make it really obvious for the reader what Dylan is working through is how much of my career and my artistry do I owe to this one person? And so what she's doing is she's going back through her career and looking for echoes of Kelsey in her music. And so that's how we're gonna, right? Like content, that's, it's that Sondheim maxim, content dictates form, right? And so what we're gonna do, what I'm gonna do as a novelist is structure an album, right? We've got her debut album, also, that chapter also carries the story of, of Dylan and Kelsey first meeting. Um, and so nesting the Kelsey story within the career arc made sense because that's what Dylan is doing in her own head. Plagued by this like deep rooted sense of imposter syndrome. And she, at her core, wonders whether she is nothing but kind of like a talentless thief. And so she needed to be on this journey where she is um, coming to terms with her own skill and stepping into her own talent as an artist. And um, that quest um, for her to fully honor her past and her voice um, on her own terms was always, was always, part of the, was always part of the goal. Screenwriting is so driven by dialogue, as you well know. How do you find that translates for you within writing a novel like this? Screenwriting has helped me write dialogue in, in my novels. Um, I think that um, there are certain skills that, as you just mentioned, I think that there are things that are important in screenwriting that are traditionally not as important in novels, but if you can master them in screenwriting, they're gonna make your novel better, right? So I think that's, structure is king in screenwriting and obviously dialogue. Um, and so I do think that both of those skills helped me write once more from the top. Um, and I, I don't, um, I don't, I think my books tend, tend to have a lot of dialogue. Um, and if anything, I'm probably often, um, trimming back a bit um, because I, I have an impulse to write dialogue the way we talk, which is often circular, it's often repetitive, it's often people aren't saying exactly the thing that they mean to say the moment they need to say it. Um, and so my, my conversations will run on um, and then I need to, I, I need to take three pages and make it one and a half. Um, so that's probably my challenge in writing dialogue. Do you envision a sequel to the story coming up? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I it's it's a pretty self-contained story, um, and uh, I uh, you know I think it could be multiple seasons of a TV show if somebody wanted, but <laughs> um, but I think it's just the one book. Along those lines, what do you have in the works presently that you're excited about bringing to the bookshelf or screen next? I have. I have other things going in film and TV um, that are uh, uh, in, it's important to me and and exciting and taking up time. I am developing once more from the top for television um, with a studio and um, a great producing team. Um, it's been a fantastic project to work on. I'm really excited about it and very hopeful. Um, and uh, I have another original I idea in development um, as well that is a feminist revenge thriller that I'm super excited about. Um, and uh, I think for my next novel, I think in all of my projects, I think I continue to write about um, difficult women, <laughs> women who get called difficult, um, whether that's teenage girls or, um, a global pop icon. Um, 
I I like writing about messy, ambitious women. Um, and I think I I am probably going to be in that space for a long time. Before we go, what advice do you have for those ambitious female authors who are seeking the same sort of start to a successful career like the sort you've gotten off to so far? I think that, you know, as we were sort of talking about at the top, or not, not whatever, when you asked about when all girls sold, I, it's really easy to make the, to make the job and all of the uncertainty that comes with the job feel really scary and really big. And at the end of the day, it is just about showing up to write every day. And that's the only thing I can control. That's the only thing you can control. And that is sort of the, the basics that you need to come back to when everything else feels um, scary. Emily, it's been a pleasure speaking today. Thank you so much for taking out time to be on About the Authors TV.